I thank the organizers for the invitation. It's a big pleasure to speak at the Munich conference. Uh, and today I, I'll be telling you about uh, quantum cryptography with multipartite entanglement. Uh, actually, maybe <laughs> my talk will be much more focused than this general title, but uh, so I will uh, briefly comment about, in general, about quantum cryptography. Uh, then I'm going to focus on a task called anonymous communication. And even more specifically, I'm going to tell about uh, our work in progress on a task called anonymous conference key agreement, which I hope all, all of that will be clear by the end of the talk. And then I will uh, tell some open problems. Okay, so usually when we talk about cryptography, the first task that comes to our mind is that uh, uh, two parties want to communicate securely. So here Alice wants to send a message to Bob. The message is very sensitive, so she doesn't want anyone else to, um, to have access to this message. So in particular, the eavesdropper should not, not learn this message. So uh, for this task, quantum cryptography plays a role because we see that if we actually use quantum systems to perform this task, we can in particular achieve information theoretical security, which is not possible with classical systems. And this is, I would say, is the most well-established uh, quantum cryptographic protocol, which is quite uh, noise tolerant, which right now there has been implemented with like increasing distances and very high rates. And even uh, satellite-based UKD uh, has already been uh, demonstrated. Uh, but uh, quantum cryptography goes way beyond uh, QKD and uh, there has been already several protocols being, that were studied. And uh, for quantum cryptography, we can have either that uh, in the end we are performing a classical task and this task is enhanced by using quantum systems as for example, QKD, which now we achieve like a stronger security if we use QKD instead of, if we use quantum systems instead of only classical systems. Um, as for example, uh, we can uh, ensure that we have random bits that are uncorrelated with an eavesdropper, and uh, this can be ensured even in the called device independent scenario where we don't trust our devices. Uh, bit commitment and obvious transfer when we have two parties that don't trust each other, and uh, if we can ensure that they don't have quantum memory, this task can be implemented, while classically it cannot and so on. So there has been several protocols started and also like tasks that are intrinsically quantum. So I want to uh, share a quantum state in the network uh, such that the parts cannot recover this quantum state independently, for example, quantum secret sharing, blind quantum computation and so on. So these are just uh, a few examples. So uh, well, the subject of quantum cryptography is much broad than QKD. So, uh, in this talk, I want to focus now on uh, one other specific task, which is called anonymous communication. So now Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but now the message is not really so sensitive. The content of the message is not sensitive, but instead we wouldn't like uh, the identities of the persons who are sending and receiving this message to be public. So maybe Alice is shy, she, doesn't want, she wants to send a letter to Bob, but she doesn't want to review herself and so on. So uh, in fact, uh, uh, even a, a quantum cryptographic task, which is called anonymous quantum communication has been uh, studied. And in this case, uh, Alice wants to send a message to Bob, but now she can even send a quantum message. And uh, in fact, they are in a network and we want this uh, task to be performed anonymously in such a way that all the other parties in the network are ignorant about who is uh, sending. So the message is going to be transmitted, but we don't know uh, who of the parties are the sender and who is the receiver. Uh, so this task was firstly introduced in 2005 by Christian and Werner. Uh, making use of multipartite entanglement to achieve this task. Wait, I will get a bit more in details on that. So uh, basically, so the task is sender and receiver wants to share, uh, so Alice wants to send a quantum state to Bob. They are in a network and we want the other parts to be anonymous, to be ignorant about who is uh, exchanging these messages. 
So um, the most important ingredient for this, this protocol as it was introduced in 2005 is that uh, sender and receive, they can establish anonymous entanglement. So uh, this point I will comment a bit later. I will explain what is this task about anonymous entanglement. But I just want to, to say here the key ingredients and features of, uh, of these protocols that had, had been quite widely studied, even like more recently. So in order to implement this task, so first ingredient, anonymous entanglement, which uh, necessarily requires the parties to share a multipartite entanglement state. Secondly, these protocols, they heavily rely on the use of classical subroutines. So these classical subroutines, in this uh, reference of broadband and TAP in 2007, they introduced a lot of uh, sub protocols that allows, for example, uh, many parties in a network to compute the parity of their inputs in such a way that the inputs are not revealed. Uh, that allows them, for example, to perform a veto to, uh, for a task. And all of that, even if we have corrupted participants, even we, if we cannot trust that all the parts are acting honestly. So these, these uh, protocols, they are classical in the sense that uh, the inputs and outputs are all classical, but they require that all the parties in the network, they share bipartite private channels. And so far, the only way we know to implement bipartite private channels is if we would actually do it via QKD. So basically, I'm saying that these are classical subroutines, but in fact, if we would really like to implement that, we would need a quantum resource to ensure that we have these bipartite private channels. Uh, and then after this uh, first uh, introduction of this protocol, there has been uh, several attempts. So the first protocol required that the parts share a very specific multipartite entanglement state. So after that, there has been several attempts to try to relax this assumption. So do, do we really need to be sure that we have this uh, specific multipartite entanglement state? Or can we verify this state? Or can we uh, tolerate some noise on this state? So afterwards, there, there has been several attempts which improved a little bit uh, the initial protocol, but still, even up to today, Either the protocol has to have a trusted source, and then maybe it can tolerate some noise if some um, assumptions are made about what type of noise is in the network, or they are very impractical. So they rely on some verification, which would require a lot of uh, uh, quantum systems and basically not tolerate much noise. Uh, also, I would like to mention that in most of these works, they were not really interested in in securing uh, the message. So the most important features is that the uh, sender and receiver don't have, do not have their identities revealed, but we don't really care if we lose the message or not. So, uh, well, uh, yeah, except for this, uh, this protocol from 2007, all the others don't really address uh, the security of the message. Uh, okay, so, uh, to give a bit more an idea on what this protocol is based about, I, I, I wanted to explain about this main ingredient that I said is the anonymous entanglement. So anonymous entanglement is the following, uh, well, let's say cryptographic task. Here we have four parties. They share a GHZ state. So GHZ is this very particular state is a superposition of zeros and ones. And now let's consider that uh, the sender and receiver, they don't do anything, but the other parts in the network, they make measurements on the X base, okay? So when this happens, depending on the parity of the outcome of these parties, then the sender and receiver ends up with a maximally entangled state up to some uh, unitary rotation, okay? So if they would like to, uh, establish this entanglement in an anonymous way, we could do the following. They first receive the GZ state, then whoever is not a participant, make a measurement on the X basis and broadcast this outcome. 
And then the sender, the sender and receiver, in order to hide their identity, they can just broadcast random bits to pretend that they measured in the X basis. And uh, the sender who knows who are the not, not the participants can then correct the state. And then at the end of the protocol, sender and receiver have established entanglement. So the bigger uh, entangled state is now, uh, well, let's say broken, and now we have entanglement only between sender and receiver. And then afterwards, the sender can teleport the, the quantum message that they wanted to send to the receiver. And the goal is that at the end of the protocol, the other parties are ignorant about uh, who, who is communicating. And also, sender also doesn't know, sorry, receiver also doesn't know who is the sender. So, to achieve this task uh, in an anonymous way, it's very important that uh, anonymous entanglement could be established between any two parts in the network. Otherwise, we would already know that certain participants could not uh, perform this task. So part of the identity would be revealed. And uh, very nicely, the GHZ state, which is a genuine uh, multipartite entangled state, allows us to perform this, uh, this task. And if, even with any number of parts. So here I gave an example with four, but actually we could have any number of parties. Another important thing is that uh, for the protocol to be anonymous, any, both the resource and any public communication that the parts are performing should be permutational invariant. So for example, here in this step, it's quite important that uh, the sender and receiver broadcast a random bit to pretend that uh, and they could be actually measuring the X base. So any steps that are publicly really revealed, uh, they should be permutationally invariant such that uh, uh, the identities are not revealed. So uh, these are the main uh, ingredients of uh, the anonymous state transmission. So the sender transmitted a quantum state to Bob in an anonymous way. Um, okay, so now I want to talk about uh, a specific type of transmission that was a task that was uh, introduced uh, very recently in this paper by uh, Frederick Rahan, uh, Jan de Jong, and Anna Papa, which is the task of anonymous conference key agreement. Uh, so first, to break into in two parties, I want to just uh, define what is conference key agreement. So conference key agreement is the generalization of QKD for more parties. So now I don't want to establish a key only between Alice and Bob, but between several parties. So at the end, I want that all the parties share the same string of bits in such a way that the eavesdropper is uh, ignorant about uh, she cannot know this key. And uh, this task has been already uh, studied for quite a long time. And also with the introduction of multipartite entanglement to perform this task, which has been shown to be uh, more efficient, more advantageous um, in terms of key rates. Uh, and the task of anonymous conference key agreement would, ben would then be to perform a to generate a conference key between several parties, a subset of parties in a bigger network. So here uh, we have a network with several parties and at the end, we actually want that a subset of the parts um, establish a secret key. So again, uh, similarly to um, anonymous state transmission, another very uh, important uh, Ingredient is anonymous multipartite entanglement. And here it's just a generalization of that task that I just explained. So now if I have several parties that share a GHZ state, now the ones who are not involved in the, the key, who are not participants, they should measure in the X phases and this generates a smaller GHZ state. So before I had a six partite GHZ state, now I ended up with a three party GHZ state. Uh, and then after, the, after that, the parts could, for example, measure in the Z basis, only this uh, 
a smaller number of parties and they could generate a key. So that's basically the idea of this anonymous conference key agreement. But I would like to point out uh, some problems in terms of practicality of this uh, first protocol that was introduced. So uh, first of all, the, the protocol relied on the, after the establishment, establishment of anonymous entanglement, a smaller, between uh, a smaller number of parties, the parts should verify that they actually have a, a GHZ state between this subset of the parties. And in, the, in this reference, this, the authors use the uh, verification based on verifying the GHZ state. And for this verification, most of the rounds of the protocol, they actually had to verify. So they could not be used for key generation, but for verification. So this made the protocol in practice very inefficient. Also, at, at the moment, for, for the way the protocol was designed, it could only um, the, the source of the state, so the, the source who generates the state should be trusted. So it could not have a, we could not have a needs dropper that, for example, has a purification of the, the state that's generated. Uh, and also the protocol could not be robust to noise. So the verification only passes if the state is very close to the GHZ state, while we would actually want some protocol that can tolerate some amount of noise, a bit like in QKD. Uh, nowadays, there is uh, protocols that can tolerate quite a high amount of noise, and the same for conference key agreements. So we would like these features to also be uh, be obtained for the anonymous conference key agreement. OK, so now I'm going to talk about uh, uh, a work that is currently in progress that should be on archive soon. That is a collaboration between uh, Dusseldorf and Berlin. So with Federico, Hermann, Dagmar, Jan, Frederick, and Anna, and they, these three was, were the authors of this first uh, anonymous conference key agreement paper. And uh, basically our goal is to design a robust anonymous conference key agreement protocol. Uh, so to be more specific, we would like the protocol to be efficient such that we don't have to, to test the, the resource state in almost all the rounds and also to be robust. So in particular, usually in, in uh, QKD or conference key agreement, we have these steps of error correction and privacy simplification, which is what allows us to tolerate noise. And we uh, incorporate these steps in our protocol. And also we aim to address an untrusted source. So we would like to uh, let an eavesdropper to hold the purification of the source. Uh, so in our work, we are going to address uh, two levels of anonymity. So first I have a, a network with several participants. The sender can choose who are the receivers, but they all know who is establishing the key. So the receivers know the sender and what are, who are the other receivers. And what we call fully anonymous conference key agreement is then the other parts in the network don't know who are sender and receivers, but also the receivers. The only thing they know is I am a receiver. I don't know who is sending me this, with whom I'm establishing this conference key. So we will have these two different levels. Uh, and uh, well, the first result that we obtained is related to the security definition. So uh, we now have a task where we want to perform uh, an anonymous uh, communication, but we also want that the, the communicated message, which is the key that is established of, at the end is also secure. So we have to uh, incorporate in the security definition, both uh, the secrecy of the key and the anonymity of this communication. Um, and then both of them, both of these uh, security definitions, so uh, secrecy has been defined in the context of QKD and conference key agreement, and anonymity has been defined in the context of this anonymous communication protocol. Uh, but then we, a very nice result that we obtain is that uh, by imposing that, uh, okay, I want my, the final state of my protocol to be close to an ideal state, we are able to uh, derive three uh, sufficient conditions. So integrity, CKA security, and anonymity. 
And I'm going to talk a little bit about that. So these three conditions are sufficient to, to prove security in, this, in the sense of this equation, that the final state is close to what we would expect to be an ideal state. Um, so, uh, so a protocol is secured, so I just want to informally <laughs> uh explain a bit about these conditions so integrity means that uh, i want the protocol to have a well-defined sender and receivers so a single sender and well-defined receivers uh, or the protocol should abort if this happens except with uh, probability uh, epsilon integrity here also we want that if the sender and the receivers are honest then the protocol either should abort for all the participants or it should generate a secure key, a secure conference key between the sender and the receivers only. And uh, also, of course, we want to impose anonymity so that uh, and the anonymity condition here, we are imposing at the level of the state that the output state satisfies the anonymity condition, which I'm going to talk a little bit more because this is a bit uh, a more new definition. So if D is the set of the dishonest parties, we say that the state of the protocol is anonymous if we look at uh, any subset of non-participants and the eavesdropper, these states should be independent of who are the senders and receivers. So if I look at the subset of parts who are not participants in these instances, and I look at this state when I is the sender, or I look at this state when another node I prime is the sender. So the anonymity condition imposes that these uh, two states should be the same. So this is uh, the first part that I said, the, the, the final state should be independent of the remaining parts. And uh, this doesn't impose any condition on the state of the participants, so the sender and receivers. And also, if they are dishonest, they could just tell the identity to everyone. So there is no condition if sender and receivers are dishonest. And uh, similarly for the fully ACA, so when we want the receivers to also not know the identity of the sender and other parties. So now in this in these states where we impose conditions, we can also include the receivers. So if any subset of non-participants and receivers, they state at the end of the protocol should be independent of who are the other sender and receivers. Um, and now no conditions apply if we have that the sender is dishonest, because if the sender is dishonest, they can just say the identity of everyone. Um, okay, so basically the anonymity condition is a, a symmetry that the state would should have should satisfy in order not to reveal the identity of the other party. Okay, uh, now I. I want to already talk a little bit more about the specific protocols that we consider and in which uh, network scenario our protocols are. So what is the, the network model that we are considering? So here now, maybe different from other anonymous protocols, we have an eavesdropper who can control the source and she prepares the state that is sent. Some of the, the nodes, they can be dishonest and afterwards they could collaborate with the eavesdropper. So one assumption that we had to impose such that we could handle uh, an eavesdropper was that the parties, so the participants, the, sorry, the parties in the network, they cannot have a arbitrary quantum memory. So they should either have no quantum memory or short lived quantum memory. Uh, but we, con we consider that this source, it can, um, so each channel can transmit one qubit per use. So either the source generates a JZ state, or it could generate bell pairs to this joint set at the same time. And I just want to say that this is quite stronger than previous works that showed the uh, advantage of multipath item entanglement for conference key agreements where actually it assumed that the source could generate a single bell pair. Here I'm allowing the source to, for example, generate a bell pair between these two, these two, and these two at the same, at the single use of this, of this source. Um, okay, and now I, so our protocols is based on that uh, network scenario. And again, the key, the key ingredients are 
again, the anonymous multipart item tunnel. So at some point, the parts should uh, perform this protocol where from a GHZ between all the parts in the network, they generate a GHZ between only the sender and the receivers. Uh, the conference key, ag uh, key, key agreement part is based on the generalization of the BB84 protocol for N parts, which was uh, derived uh, uh, some time ago. And uh, this protocol only, only requires the parts to make measurements in the Z basis and the X base. Uh, and the protocol, of course, also relies on this uh, classical subroutines that I mentioned to, for example, designate who are the senders and who are the receivers. Um, and any other asymmetry that we would have in the protocol such that we can make the communication uh, secret. So uh, for example, this is what I try to just say. So the identity assignment and any non-symmetric steps. So any step that could reveal the identity of uh, participants, they need to be performed anonymously. And then for that, we rely on these classical subroutines. So I just want to mention that when we use these classical subroutines, they usually uh, need for each round of these routines, they need any square where n here is the number of participants, bipartite private bits. So they, they are classical, but they are not for free. As I said, we need QKD to implement them. Uh, and we, our protocol, since it re relies on the NBB84 protocol, it has quite an efficient verification. So it doesn't rely on verifying that I actually have a GHZ state between a smaller number of parties, but directly that these parts can generate a key which only relies on two parameters, uh, the Q bears on the X basis and the Z basis, which only depends on measurements in the X basis and the Z basis of the parties. Um, so just to mention, so we are able to prove uh, security of our ACA protocol, but our fully ACA protocol, it satisfies integrity and CKA security. But unfortunately, at the moment, we are only able to prove some weak anonymity for these protocols, which means that the receivers cannot collude with the eavesdropper. Uh, and now I'm about to finish. And I want to compare, because as I said, the, the task we are performing here, so both we are interested in anonymity and in secrecy, but uh, we are transmitting a, a classical message. So at the end, the parts want to establish a classical key. So of course, these classical subroutines could be used to implement such a task. So in order to really compare if we are having an advantage by using multipartite entangled states and uh, doing the anonymous multipartite entanglement, uh, we also consider protocols. So we design protocols based only on this classical subroutine. So they only require bipartite entanglement and they are, um, secure according to our security definition. And then we ask, OK, is there an advantage of using multipart identity? And then, uh, yes, to finalize, I wanted to, to show this plot. So here we are representing the, the rates of the asymptotic Q rates. So R here is the protocols that are based on genuine multipart identity, so on, on GHZ states. RB are the protocols based only on the classical subroutine. So they only require bipartite entanglement. Uh, so these are the plots. So the green region means that, uh, OK, then I have an advantage. It's better to use the protocols based on multipartite entanglement. The red region, then we don't have an advantage anymore. And here we have a trade off of the number of parties in the network, the total number of parties in the network. As we increase the number of parts, it gets higher to have an advantage. This gets more difficult to have an advantage because we are considering actually that uh, the losses in the fiber. Um, and interestingly, we see so the uh, full lines are for the fully ACA protocol and the dashed lines for the ACA protocol. So we see that actually when we have a higher level of anonymity, we have a higher advantage, a higher boost in the performance by multipart identity. OK, so uh, well, to summarize, we have uh, presented efficient and robust protocols for the task of anonymous conference key agreements. 
we have uh, presented a unified security definition that uh, uh, brings both the concept of anonymity and secrecy together. Um, from the, the plot that I showed, we have seen that actually a, a higher level of anonymity leads to a higher boost in the performance if we actually use the multi-part entanglement based protocol. And uh, well, finally, I want to mention a few open questions. So we have this uh, unified secure definition. Uh, it's still an open point whether it actually implies composable security of the protocol, like we have for the secure definition of conference key agreement and QKD. Uh, it would be very interesting if we could remove the assumption of bounded storage of the participants or short-lived memory for the participants and still keep the high performance that uh, uh, genuine multipartite entanglement brings, but it's still open. And uh, also the strong security for the fully ACA protocol, so the strong anonym anonymity, can we actually achieve it for the fully ACA protocol if it's based on multipartite entanglement. So these are open questions. The last one is very much related to also the previous uh, anonymity um, security in the presence of uh, an untrusted source, which so far it's an open point in, in all these protocols. Yes, and with that, I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Claudia, for your talk. Uh, please uh, post your questions on Slack so that I can collect them and ask them. Uh, for the time being, uh, I was wondering uh, for your anonymous uh, teleportation then, or you, you make this uh, channel and then you say you can now make teleportation, send the quantum information using this. But doesn't the receive uh, the sender at least unwill himself because I mean he needs to send classical information as well. Yes, and uh, wait, I go back there. So that's why these protocols they were also they also rely on the. Oops, I cannot see what is in here, but I believe are the classical. No, they also rely on these classical protocols that I mentioned uh, here, the classical subroutines. And then, for example, at the time of the teleportation, what they can do is a, a parity protocol where Alice is actually go, the sender is going to input the bits for the teleportation. The other parts are going to input zero. And Bob, for example, can input a random bit such that only he can recover um, the bits that Alice is sent. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, so th that's the, uh, so unfortunately only with the, uh, the anonymous uh, entanglement and the multi entanglement protocol, I don't believe it would be possible because indeed there is classical communication that is necessary. And the point is all the classical communications I delegate to these classical subroutines, but I want to minimize it as much as I can such that most of the time I'm just uh, uh, using the multi entanglement. Okay. Oh, yeah. Uh, any questions already? No, I don't see any questions. So please uh, post your questions on Slack uh, in case uh, then there will be a round table talk, uh, round table discussion afterwards. Uh, actually, I would have uh, yet another one uh, in your comparison. I mean, you say you um, include loss now, uh, but then you assume that you have a lossless channel to, co to, to distribute the classical counterparts or whatever. I mean, otherwise. No, 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 the, the what, what, classical what, what counterpart. Do you, what do you uh, compare now? This yes, uh, yes. private channel space protocol. So for the classical counterparts, then the, the losses, they go as transmissivity square. The losses, no, the transmission goes as transmissivity square. While for when I have to use the multipartite entanglement, then it's transmissivity to the power of n. Yeah. So there are considered laws for the classical subroutines in the sense of the they are considered for the QKD establishment. Okay, so, so you include laws, but then it's much uh, smaller because it's only between the two of them or whatever. Yes, it, it's two between parts. only two parties, while the other I need to receive the photons from the mm -hmm. end parties. Okay, yeah. Yeah, thanks for the time being there. 
I do not see any questions on Slack, uh, but um, yeah, people will come then to the round table afterwards. And we continue with the talk by uh, Christian Deppe. Uh, Christian Teppe 